Hi, my name is Alona Lashova. I'm a co-editor of Commons Journal, and you're listening to a podcast called Toulon Didn't Read. In this podcast, we talk with our authors about their texts and about what has been left out of them. In the first months of full-scale invasion of Russia, many experts, Ukrainian, Western and even Russian liberals, expressed opinions that Russian economy will face serious problems because of Western sanctions. But these did not happen, even to the level that would make it impossible to continue the armed aggression against us. To understand the economic war against Russia, Better, we invited Simon Pirani, British historian and researcher of energy. He studies the global energy system and the role of Russian oil and gas in it. Long before the full-scale invasion in his publications, Simon warned that dependency on Russian fossil fuels does not lead to anything good, neither politically nor environmentally. Unfortunately, he was right. Now he continues to study Russian energy, advocates for the most radical sanctions on Russia and actively calls for international solidarity with Ukrainian resistance. Simon, hello. Hello, Alona. In the article on your blog, People and Nature, about economic war against Russia, which we translated in Ukrainian, by the way, You state that, uh, I quote, the aim of the Western powers' sanctions on Russia is to try to discipline the Putin government, not to destroy it. Could you elaborate on this idea and in general explain your approach to analysis of sanctions? Thank you for inviting me to do this. Um, I hoped in that article that you mentioned, to develop a framework for understanding the terrible events that we're living through. And an important part of this is to understand the relationship between the Russian elite and the ruling classes of the big uh, Western powers. Uh, So we can think about deceptions and false narratives on both sides. The Kremlin narrative that the cause of the war is NATO aggression, that Russia is threatened militarily, that Ukraine is a proxy for the Western powers. I'm sure your listeners know very well why this is all false. Uh, Partly, uh, for one thing, we can see it's false because of the nature of the war. This is a war against civilians. This is a war when they send this rocket, which is designed to destroy battleships uh, into a block of flats. Uh, It's a war where many atrocities have been committed against civilians, where children are deported and so on. So uh, this is not a reaction to a military threat by uh, NATO. And in fact, as, as we also know, one of the wonderful achievements of the Putin government has been to increase the membership of NATO in Uh, Central and Eastern Europe, with Finland joining and and Sweden uh, waiting to join. But the Western narrative also makes no sense. Uh, We hear this narrative from the American government, from uh, the British government, that Putin must be stopped and they're going to stop him because he represents a danger to democratic values that the Western powers uphold. But we all know that they uphold these values in a very limited way, a way that uh, suits their interests, that they're completely cynical, that they support and have long supported regimes all over the world that trample on these uh, democratic values in order to intimidate their own people. Uh, Misogynistic, warmongering Saudi Arabia, apartheid Israel, have been supported by the Western powers for decades. Um, So... What, it, it, so if we reject those false narratives, uh, how do we uh, develop our own understanding? I think um, a good way to do this is to look at the way the Russian-Western relationship has developed in 
post-Soviet times. So if, if we go back, not even to the beginning, but to uh, the accession of Putin to power in the early 2000s, at that time, the Western powers were telling Russia that they considered it to be an ally. And during the war in Chechnya, multiple war crimes, multiple breaches of human rights, NATO was very openly supporting Russia and saying that it was a bastion against uh, Islamic terrorism and so on. And I think what evolved at that time, I think that the, the Western politicians never loved Putin uh, and never completely trusted him, uh, but they saw uh, the opportunity uh, to use him as a gendarme, if you like, for capital, um, a gendarme in that part of the world. Capitalism needs order in order for its economy uh, to flourish. And of course, it's, it's relevant that Putin uh, came to office at exactly the time that the oil prices started to go up and up and up. And they went up continuously between uh, almost to the week that he uh, entered the Kremlin, right up until 2009, I think, the oil prices went up almost every single month, one month after another, and, and reached a very high level, 140 something dollars uh, a barrel. And so after all the disaster that Russia and Ukraine had, and other post-Soviet countries had lived through in the 1990s, there was an economic boom. And uh, that boom for Russia uh, was very much an oil boom. And... Uh, the Western powers were happy to see Putin uh, bringing some sort of order to Russia domestically, because it was in quite a chaotic state, uh, reconstituting uh, the Russian state and effectively having his uh, sphere of influence. And um, I think this policy continued into the 2010s. It, it, a little detail, if you remember the Western reaction to uh, the Russian uh, action in Donbass, the, inter the military intervention in Donbass in 2014, none of the sanctions that were imposed. So first of all, the sanctions that were imposed at that time were very limited. And secondly, they were always, I think, every single measure was related to the annexation of Crimea, not to the action in Donbass. So... This was the Western powers saying to Russia, look, if, if, if you send your uh, Chechen fighters or your extreme uh, nationalists into Donbass to support these uh, so-called republics, uh, we can, we can kind of live with that. We cannot live with you disrupting this international order that was set up after the Second World War and annexing uh, the territory uh, of another country. And of course, they uh, they allowed Russia and uh, its client regime in Syria to torture and murder people uh, right through 2015 and 16, rather than allow those people uh, the democratic rights uh, that I was talking about. So I think when the Kremlin was driven uh, to the invasion uh, in 2022, and I think that was from its own internal dynamics, its own internal crisis and its own careering towards this imperialist nationalism, I think then, of course, the Western powers uh, had to take action. Uh, from their point of view, you, you could not have military action on this scale in Europe um, and uh, just get away with it. So um, they saw this as very dangerous, as destabilizing to Europe. Um, and the end result they want is to restore some sort of stability. They also see all this in uh, the context of their relationship with China, which, unlike Russia, is becoming a powerful uh, economic force. Uh, at the moment, I think the main barrier to any settlement that the Western powers could conceivably agree to is the very aggressive, desperate nature of the war that the Kremlin is waging. But we need to be alert to the fact that for some Western governments and for Western capital, 
an acceptable end to the war is not the same as it is for Ukrainians. Not the same as it might be for the Ukrainian government, not the same as it might be uh, for Ukrainian people. And I think it's possible that uh, at the end of this year or next year, um, we could uh, be in a situation where the Western powers are putting pressure on Zelensky um, to agree to peace terms that he doesn't like and that many Ukrainians also would not like. Um, so that's, to, that, that's about the, the, the general picture you asked about, uh, how we can understand uh, what we're living through. Um, about the sanctions, so I think the sanctions regime, again, reflects this approach of, of the Western powers. I think we have to bear in mind that um, the sanctions were never going to wreck the Russian economy in the way that some people hoped uh, shortly after the invasion. Sanctions take a long time. If you look at the sanctions on Iran, uh, they've been in place for, I don't know, decades. And uh, the Iranian economy functions. Uh, people protest. They go into the streets on the issue of the headscarf and the government still has enough repressive force uh, to uh, prevent that movement from uh, overwhelming it. Um, and so I think the, the effect on the Russian economy will be very bad over the long term. And I think, so for example, uh, the, the, I mean, the Soviet economy, uh, one of the reasons it collapsed was it couldn't keep up with the technological developments uh, in the Western economies. And I think that that's the same that's true of, of the Russian economy. We're seeing signs of that with technologies that are needed uh, in, in, to get the oil out of the ground. Um, so th 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 that broader aim of sanctions it, it, it was, was never going to happen quickly. But then if we talk about the sanctions on the sales of oil and gas, so first of all, with oil, the aim of the current uh, setup, which is, not, which is not a ban on sales of oil, but it's this price cap, the aim of it, the Western politicians say that the aim is to keep the oil flowing, but reduce the flow of money uh, to the Kremlin. Of course, that's very uh, tricky. There, uh, there's an excellent, uh, I mean, there are many really good people working on this, but there's an excellent uh, NGO uh, which researches this, the uh, Centre for Research on Energy and Clean Air. Uh, and they have been producing reports and monitoring this process very, very, and presenting that information in a way we can all uh, understand. And I mean, they say, lower the price cap or impose a ban on sales of oil. This would be uh, the effective uh, way to build on uh, the sanctions that have been imposed so far. There are not sanctions on gas uh, exports to Europe, but... Uh, and what we've seen there is an incredible act of self-harm by the Kremlin, uh, where Putin obviously decided at some point uh, in the middle of last year that the way to respond to the sanctions on oil was to stop uh, or reduce flows of Russian gas to Europe, which he thought would create trouble among the European nations. This was not a completely stupid uh, idea, but it didn't work. Um, but it's, it's, it's Russia that has reduced those flows and it's clear that, it's the, that the instruction has come from the Kremlin uh, and by August of last year, the flows through the North Stream pipeline to Germany were down at zero and that's why some of this conversation about who blew up the pipeline is so stupid because actually the, the uh, Gazprom had stopped using the pipeline uh, a few weeks before whoever blew it up, blew it up. Um, and it, I, I, I had a job for quite a while at the Oxford Institute for Energy Studies following the gas trade in uh, Russia, Ukraine, Europe in, in quite a bit of detail. And it's amazing to think of this act of self-harm because Russia, actually not even as Russia, but the Soviet Union built this business up with Germany, with Austria, uh, in the 1970s and 80s. 
and uh, the managers in Gazprom prided themselves on the fact that this was that basically a scheme for subsidizing cheap gas supplies to Russian people and Russian industry with the export sales to Europe. And the whole thing's been wrecked um, for uh, the Kremlin's purposes of the war. It's been sacrificed uh, to the war. And um, of course, the, uh, the managers of Gazprom, for all that your listeners care about this, uh, they're in uh, despair because that business has been wrecked. Uh, just as many lives have been wrecked and, and destroyed uh, in the cause of this uh, lurch towards this, this imperialist nationalism. So th th the final point to make, uh, Alona, on this question is that um, there's a very important story about... So that's oil, that's gas, two different stories. Um, then there's a very important story about money because... Uh, I think the whole relationship between post-Soviet Russia and the Western powers was based on the, or central to that relationship, let's say it like that, central to that relationship was the ability of the Russian oligarchs and other uh, rich people who looted the Russian economy in the 1990s to take their ill-gotten gains and recycle them through the Western financial system, sometimes uh, through the offshore zones, but also through legal channels, through the Swiss banks, through the property market in London. And the sanctions on money, this money, have been, uh, I mean, our government here in London has been, uh, they uh, particularly are the uh, two prime ministers ago, Boris Johnson, um, he was very, uh, used to love uh, telling everybody how they were coming down on, on Russian oligarchs. Of course, they were not. They were coming down in a very, very partial uh, way. And uh, the, 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 there's ample evidence from journalists, uh, from uh, researchers about how the uh, money has simply been moved around uh, to somewhere else. And in the article that you mentioned, I argued that this is very much about the nature of, of modern capitalism. It's structural. Uh, this, the whole existence of these offshore zones and these grey schemes for protecting uh, rich people's wealth uh, that has, has grown uh, in world capitalism ever since the 1980s, partly with the uh, enhanced by electronic uh, technology. And so um, th th this is structural about cap capitalism and it's always going to be difficult for governments for political or wartime purposes to suddenly disrupt and change those structures and I think that's a problem uh, they have. Thanks for these detailed analysis. For sure, for Western countries breaking up ties with Russia completely would be very, very difficult. But there is a country which used to be closely interconnected with Russia economically and now broke all the connections. It is Ukraine. So we cannot say that it is impossible. And I want to ask you what could be done more by Western countries. In other words, what do we as leftists need to demand from the Western elites to do now to help Ukraine win the war? I think you're right. I think you're right about Ukrainian capital, although some... I, I, I was speaking to some friends uh, who are um, connected with one of the uh, very good environmentalist NGOs in Ukraine, and they're not so sure about the Ministry of Energy, which obviously is currently dominated by people who... Uh, worked for many years in the nuclear sector. So if we're worried about Ukrainian capital, uh, that, might be one, that might be one place to look. But that's, that, that's not strictly relevant uh, to your question. So, of course, there, I, I mean, I agree with you that the, those ties have really been broken uh, and uh, perhaps broken uh, forever and certainly for a very, very long time. Uh, how, what could be done... Uh, by the Western powers to similarly uh, break such ties. Well, clearly, uh, 
so going back to the oil, clearly uh, the, the, the idea that I mentioned uh, of reducing this uh, price cap to $30 is what quite a lot of uh, researchers are talking about um, could do uh, a lot of damage. I mean, I think we have, to, we have to also acknowledge the role of China here. China basically has seen this situation as an opportunity to buy Russian oil at a discount because now the Russians are selling oil, but they, not everybody wants to buy it. And so the Chinese have basically come along and said, well, fine, guys, we'd, we'll buy your oil, but can you knock 10 20 $30 off the price of a barrel, please? Because otherwise... Uh, we're not interested. And uh, I think the uh, weakness of Russia in relation to China economically is, is, is very important. I think the other aspect of this is that if we go back to uh, the, right ar the situation straight after the invasion of Ukraine, um, this is not really about sanctions, but it's about Western companies. The, the big oil companies did say that they would pull out of Russia. And I, I, that struck me at the time as being a real change in this uh, relationship uh, between uh, the Western powers and Russia. Now, have they made good on that? Um, in the case of ExxonMobil, yeah, it seems to have left. But in the case of BP, which uh, has a huge commitment in the form of its shareholding in Rosneft, uh, which is the biggest, you know, the company headed by Igor Sechin um, and the biggest state oil company, they have that shareholding. Now, Putin has made things more complicated because he then issued this decree saying that if you're a Western company with assets in Russia, um, you, you have to get permission from the government to uh, sell those assets. And obviously that gives the government a say in how those assets are sold. So BP is saying at the moment that we're not uh, profiting from this. Uh, we have uh, 580 million pounds, so that's sort of six, 650 million euros probably, uh, sitting in a Russian bank account. We're not touching it. Um, and uh, we're hoping still to sell this stake, which represents a big part of BP's uh, upstream oil business. I think there would be people in BP who are quietly hoping that the war will come to an end in such a way as they can uh, resume uh, that business. That's not what they're saying publicly, but I think those hopes must uh, exist. And another company where they clearly exist is Total Energies in uh, France, which until at the end of last year, actually resisted the idea of pulling out of Russia. They work in the gas sector with uh, Novatec, uh, uh, a big uh, Kremlin-controlled, essentially, uh, company. The other thing is that uh, uh, the oil service companies, um, who are less sort of known to to the public, but very, very important part of the industry. So Halliburton and Baker Hughes have left Russia. But Schlumberger, which is the third of the big oil, oil field service companies, has not left Russia and continues uh, to work there. So um, I think that that is uh, part of the answer. I mean, the other thing which uh, friends uh, here are fighting on very hard is this issue of, of the money um, and showing how much more could be done. So to give you an example, uh, after the government made, uh, our government uh, m made all these great statements about we're going to clamp down on these Russian oligarchs, no friends of Putin are going to come here and so on. Um, and uh, uh, right at the, just after the invasion, actually, a, a good group of young people um, occupied one of the uh, mansions in London belonging to one of the Russian oligarchs. I can't remember which one. Um, but uh, then the government introduced a law requiring foreign companies that own property in the UK above a certain value to register who they are. So if you had a company in the British Virgin Islands or in 
uh, one of these offshore zones and it owned a mansion in London, and a lot of them did, you had to, uh, you had to go on this register. The deadline for going on the register was the 31st of January. In February, uh, the uh, NGOs who work on this, Transparency International um, and Global Witness, looked at the situation and uh, Transparency International reported there are 51,000 properties in the UK whose owners we still don't know. Um, some of them simply did not register. Um, there, there are other methods they found. So, for example, a lot of these... Uh, assets which were owned by offshore companies, there's now been a huge increase in the last few months of the numbers of citizens of Jersey or the British Virgin Islands or um, uh, some of the other offshore zones, the Isle of Man, which is actually part of the UK. There's been a big increase in the number of citizens of these uh, places that own mansions in London. But of course, they don't own them. They own them on behalf of somebody else. So uh, there are many, many uh, ways in which um, th th this regime could be tightened up. Uh, there's a lot of... So one thing that the Western powers did do straight after the invasion was to freeze the Russian central bank's money in the Western banking system. And that's a very large sum of money. There are now members of our parliament who are saying, OK, you've frozen it just take it away from them and put it into a fund for the reconstruction of Ukraine uh, and the recovery of Ukraine. And the government's very, very nervous uh, about doing this. Uh, they, you know, they say, well, we don't want to set a precedent because, because again, I mean, going back to the purpose of the state is to, is to defend capitalism. And the whole point about the rule of law, which Western politicians talk about, is... Uh, sanctity of uh, the rights of property. So they're very, very nervous uh, to take such steps as that. And a last, just a last example um, about the way this, this whole sort of little world in London of, of, of companies and uh, lawyers, uh, accountants, uh, how, they, how it works to defend uh, the Russian war machine, a case was brought uh, in 2021, a legal case was brought in the UK against a journalist, Elliot Higgins, who works for um, uh, for Bellingcat. And uh, Bellingcat published some material about Evgeny Prigozhin, uh, the head of the Wagner Group, uh, this horrible uh, warmonger. And Prigozhin uh, brought a case. Prigozhin was already sanctioned because he, uh, because of stuff related to the elections in the US. So he was under sanctions. But he brought a case against Elliot Higgins in court. And defending these libel cases is the worst thing for journalists in this country because they're so expensive, they're so difficult to uh, deal with. And of course, rich people like Evgeny Prigozhin have any amount of money for lawyers. Because he was sanctioned, he had to he had to get permission from the government to proceed with this case, uh, which he did. And the government uh, specifically uh, granted lawyers the permission to act for Prigozhin. Uh, and this case was uh, making great difficulties for the journalist in question. Uh, and only after the invasion and only after uh, Prigozhin and Prigozhin's role uh, was was brought out to the public by himself, did the whole uh, case collapse and the whole thing go away. But from the journalist's point of view, it was, it was a real danger to him and to his publication. Uh, that uh, So it, I'm, I'm telling you that story to show you this incredibly unequal uh, balance of forces. And are Russian oligarchs still using it? Yes, of course they are. And uh, is our government doing uh, what they should be doing or what Transparency International or Global Witness or the other campaign organisations are saying? No, they're not. Um, and that, again, I mean, I would say is, is very much about something that's structural in, in, in capitalism. Very interesting, especially about the mansions of Russian oligarchs in London. But let's uh, move to another topic I wanted to discuss.
last autumn many European leaders were saying that Europe will face an energy crisis. It seemed to me as a populist uh, speculation at the time, to be honest. Um, I can tell you a story. Last October, I've been to Berlin and I remember seeing news about energy crisis on these huge TVs in the city center, which was also completely lit up in the evening, even office buildings that are not used in the night. At the same time, my mom was in Kiev without electricity and water. So I was like, wow, you guys better do not know what energy crisis really is. But if to look at the issue not so emotionally, but rationally, could you explain what kind of consequences did Europeans actually encounter because of the sanctions and how these issues could be avoided in the future? Thanks, uh, Alona. It, it, it's uh, it, you've 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 explained very well uh, the way that this uh, term energy crisis is misused, and um, I, I think the uh, your picture that you've painted of of your parents there without uh, electricity that they really need. And you know the street lit up in in Berlin. I think is tells us a lot about what an energy crisis actually is, and it's one of these uh, phrases that is thrown around um, in order very often to conceal uh, what's really going on. So the the energy system, or the you know the system for providing electricity and heat or uh, you know motive power to drive cars or whatever form of energy people need the system is very big and complicated and uh, it's true that some uh, some disruption happened to it but let's look at exactly what the disruption was so I think three I think two two things really one, the the result of the invasion and the crisis that it provoked in uh, the relationship between Russia and the Western powers boosted inflation generally. That was also to do with grain supplies, particularly to North Africa and the Middle East from both Russia and Ukraine, which were disrupted. Uh, Supplies of sunflower oil, which for people in North Africa can often be uh, the difference between uh if not life and death then then you know life and and a totally miserable uh existence um and of course the oil and gas prices shot up as well as that and it's important to remember that these oil uh, and gas supplies are traded daily on these uh electronic markets the markets not only reflect supply and demand, which was disrupted, but they also reflect the sentiment of those uh, traders and their guesses which, about what's going to happen in the future, which is how they make their money. Um, and the price of gas in particular shot up uh, way, way above any level that reflected um, supply and demand. And the energy companies all over Europe took the opportunity to raise their prices uh, for households very sharply and not to put them down again uh, when it became clear that uh, that there was not such a a shortage of gas as had been feared. And, of course, their profits, along with the oil companies uh, in 2022, have been absolutely huge. Um, so the second thing is there was a uh, reduction in Russian gas flows to Europe, which we spoke about a bit earlier. Uh, the amount of gas that was supplied to Germany, to the Central and Eastern European countries from Russia, fell very sharply, and it could fall further. Um, one of the things that the, 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 that Russia said um, when... Um, so NAFTA Gas Ukraini, the, the Ukrainian company, has brought a, an arbitration case um, against Russia for uh, refusing to deliver under the uh, contract in, 
the way that they're supposed to. And uh, the, Russian respond, uh, the Russian authorities responded to this by saying, well, we might just sanction NAFTA gas. Now, if they did that, uh, all the flows that currently go through Ukraine uh, of gas would stop. So that would be the flows through North Stream have stopped. Uh, the flows uh, through um, Poland have stopped. And there are just flows coming at the moment to Europe from uh, through Ukraine and Turkey. Uh, if Ukraine stops, then the flows will go down even further. So um, there, there, there is a reduction in those flows, but there are equally ways of dealing with it. And this is why this I think this whole um, discourse about uh, energy crisis and energy security, I think, is another phrase that we often hear from politicians. And um, what it's supposed to mean is that there will be a sufficient amount of energy products at all times for those who need it. But then what's need? I mean, do, you know, could those companies in Berlin really not have turned off their lights? Right. Would it really be such a disaster, which has been discussed in Germany, you know, if some of the chemical processing plants had to shut down on a Friday uh, and work four days a week instead of five uh, and not be churning their products out at the usual level? Of course, it's not going to nobody's going to die. People die if they can't turn their heat on and they're old in the winter. That's when people die. And um, so. Uh, when, when when politicians talk about energy crisis or energy security, we've always got to think what are the, what do they uh, actually mean? Now, when uh, those fears of uh, there being insufficient supplies of gas were expressed in the middle of last year, um, environmentalists, uh, energy researchers came up with very very sound proposals about how to reduce uh, the use of those energy products. And they all pointed out, we need to do this anyway because, because of the climate crisis, because of the need to reduce the role of fossil fuels in the economy. So these are researchers or campaigners who've been shouting for years already that we need to reduce the role of oil and gas in the economy. And they, their first reaction was to think, right, OK, now we've not got one crisis, the climate crisis, we've got two crises, the climate crisis and the war crisis. Let's now get on with it. And they, I mean, there were some very good reports produced, particularly in uh, Germany, by researchers there. Um, what can we do? Insulate the houses. I mean, actually, houses are much better insulated in Germany uh, than they are uh, in Ukraine, for example, but also better than in the UK. So in the UK, we have a lot of houses like this one I'm sitting in, which is more than 100 years old, uh, built in Victorian times in the 19th century. And uh, we have a government which has mucked about with uh, policy on home heating and home insulation for the last 15 years. Uh, because it's a conservative government, they're not interested in making people's homes warm. They're not interested in uh, combating climate change in practice. They're certainly not interested in supporting local government, which is how you would have to implement such schemes. So we've had years and years and years where the researchers have been screaming at them, guys, please put them in some insulation. We can just reduce everybody's use of gas like that. Um, they have not done that. Another thing which uh, the researchers have pointed out is that once you've insulated your house, instead of using a gas boiler, which is what most people here use, is to use heat pumps. This would push the demand for gas right down. And then there would have to be changes in industry in Europe. Then it's about, do you ne really need to churn out those products which you might be making money from but, you know, there's no great social benefit to them. And that is obviously a, a longer and sharper discussion. But that's the way that policy should be going. Now, unfortunately, the end of this story is that the governments in most of the European countries, faced with this double crisis, 
war and climate crisis, instead of listening to this sort of advice, actually went further down the road of uh, embedding fossil fuels in their economy uh, and said, OK, if we can't get the fossil fuels from Russia, uh, we're going to get them from somewhere else. And the German government, for example, went to Africa, uh, to African countries, Senegal, Angola, uh, I can't remember where else, and asked them to sign deals to supply liquefied natural gas. So if, if these deals work out, this will be reinforcing the sort of colonial uh, relationship between Europe uh, and Africa. And in the case of our own government, I mean, Alona, to tell the truth, I, uh, our own government is in such a mess, it's difficult to take anything they say seriously. Um, but when they had this energy crisis, uh, they said, OK, we're going to solve the energy crisis by forgetting our plan to reduce the um, production of oil and gas in the North Sea, where the UK has its own oil and gas production, and we're going to offer a lot of uh, licenses to uh, dig this uh, for this oil and gas. The, uh, this is horrible for uh, all of us and for our grandchildren's generation, but it's also important to remember it's horrible and it's also ironic, because if tomorrow I gave you a license to uh, dig for oil in the North Sea, it's very unlikely, even if you were quite a big company, it's very unlikely that you would start producing that oil for another six or seven years because you know it takes a long time. You get the license, then you go prospecting, then you see what's there, then you get your rig, then you get your finance. It all takes a long time. So obviously that is completely irrelevant, <laughs> completely irrelevant to the crisis, the, the additional crisis that's been created by the lack of Russian gas uh, supplies in Europe. Completely irrelevant because it's a different time scale. So cynically, our government has decided to use that uh, opportunity to um, dig away at the commitments it's made on climate policy. Now, I suppose at, at the final point, in a, if we're thinking about understanding all this, the way capitalism works in a in, in a sort of broader way, I think, and I, I think I tried to mention this in in the article. I think we can see that the roots of this. Uh, climate crisis and the roots of the war are sort of entangled with each other. So if we think back to the 1990s, they could have done something about climate change then. They had the Rio Agreement in 1992, which recognised that the science was clear, that you know the climate was changing because of fossil fuel consumption, and they could have taken measures. But no, they decided that it was all going to be done by market measures. And I think there's a uh, I don't want to make a sort of artificial comparison, but I think there's a real, uh, a really genuine comparison to their attitude to Russia. They thought, OK, we've got this rather strange uh, new form of capitalism is, is growing up in the uh, former Soviet countries, is very kleptocratic, very oligarchic. Um, what are we going to do with it? Now, and I've got a friend who's in the Labour Party and I had a long conversation with him and he was saying, look, what we've got to do is, uh, you know, what, 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 it was a missed opportunity um, because they could have regulated, they could have got a kind of ordered form of capitalism um, in that part of the world. But they just let all this oligarchy go crazy. And I, I, sort, of, I sort of accused him in a very nice way of having a very sort of social democratic view of the problem. This is what social democrats try to do is to try to sort of order capitalism. I mean, that's very unfair to my friend, I have to say, in case he's listening, because he's a fervent anti-capitalist. Um, and nothing would please him more than to see the end of capitalism in Russia or Ukraine or the UK or Germany or anywhere else. Um, but I, I, so our discussion was, he sort of said, well, it was a really missed opportunity to, you know, make capitalism more ordered. And I said, yeah, but was that opportunity really there or is that just in your imagination and the imagination of social democrats that, that, that what we saw in Russia and Ukraine in the 1990s was actually the real face of capitalism that's how it really works uh, the theft of state property on this massive scale this uh, this appropriation this criminal uh, 
way of appropriating uh, wealth. Uh, that's what capitalism really is. And, uh, well, we've seen the way that uh, things have developed since then. You know, I maybe have to side with your friend because before the 21st of February, like many other Ukrainians, I thought that there is a chance for a diplomatic way out of the war. Unfortunately, we were wrong. Probably we just did not want to even think that such horror that we're experiencing now is even possible. But the reality is that Russian imperialism developed to a stage that it attempts to vanish a whole country. Thinking about this, I want to ask you, how do you see the development of Russian imperialism and the role of oil and gas in this process? The first thing to say is that uh, that argument with my friend was specifically about the 1990s, because I think we've you know, there's at least two, probably more, stages of this thing. Um, in the 1990s, the uh, Western powers were discussing what to do with post-Soviet Russia. Um, I mean, one of the things they, they said, OK, you can keep the, the seat on the UN Security Council, uh, which had belonged to the Soviet Union. And uh, as I described to you earlier, when uh, at the time of the war in Chechnya, they were very anxious to keep uh, the Russian elite within uh, their uh, their orbit. And I think they've they've uh, proceeded with that right through. And um, I think at that time, I, I I think the aim of the Russian elite, the aim of Putin at that time was to consolidate the rule of the state on Russian territory. And that's why the defeat of the uh, Chechen national movement was so important, not only because of the Chechens themselves, but because of the other national uh, nationalities within uh, the Russian Federation. And also to sort of uh, establish Russia's place um, in uh, this new sort of post-Soviet world. And if you remember, uh, in 2007, uh, Putin uh, went to Munich and made this famous speech about we're not having a unipolar world and so on and so on. And I think that was the roots of some of the uh, illusions in Putin, which persist until this day uh, in the global south, where there are people in the global south who... Uh, think in terms of uh, anti-imperialism and the need to combat the, the dominant uh, powers, uh, the USA and uh, its allies, and they thought that Russia was going to be some kind of uh, friend in this. And uh, I actually, I, I see that you're, uh, there's an initiative from your organization to start a discussion um, about peripheries, uh, which I think is very, very important. And uh, I, I look forward to uh, learning more about that discussion because I, uh, the thing that we've been with friends, you know, insisting on over the last uh, year and a few months in, in the labour movement here in the UK is that uh, there's nothing whatever anti-imperialist about this um, regime. And so now, uh, and I think the, 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 the fear that I think you, you were talking about there about uh, Russian imperialism was that it would not only uh, continue to support the so-called republics in uh, Donbass, but would uh, move to this sort of full-scale war. And uh, of course, well, as you know, uh, the, the number of people who really expected this to happen on all sides was very, very uh, small. And I remember uh, because I was traveling to Russia and Ukraine for many years and friends were asking me in the end of 2021, you know, what's going to happen? And I said, well, I, I think, you know, the Russian army is going to cause more trouble in the east of Ukraine and uh, this is going to continue. Um, I, I, it, I couldn't believe that... Um, they they would um, undertake the full-scale invasion that they undertook. 
And I know why I couldn't believe it, because I knew that the um, Russian action supporting the so-called republics in 2014 and the annexation of Crimea and the sanctions that had followed, that had already done huge damage to the economic uh, project of the Russian elite. A lot of these oligarchs had suddenly found themselves, I mean, I've been saying, they suddenly found themselves sanctioned. And I've been saying to you that those sanctions aren't the most effective, but, you know, they sure disrupt your lifestyle if you have your kids in expensive paid schools in uh, London and you have your mansion in London uh, and suddenly you find that you're sanctioned. And the Russian elite hated those sanctions from 2014. I, I was still uh, working in that job uh, at Oxford and, you know, part of the job was to meet executives from oil companies, gas companies, other companies, and any Russian business person you met anywhere at any conference or event, I mean, they hated it because the, their, their view, uh, which they'd formed in the early 2000s during the oil boom, that, you know, Russia was going to uh, be able to thrive as a supplier of oil and gas to uh, the world economy. And that's, that's the position that Russia economically could have, uh, it could have developed. They thought that, you know, Russia would thrive in that way and that they would thrive as well. So, and from the point of view of those sort of people, I mean, a lot of whom have now left Russia or in Dubai or in Cyprus or wherever in the course of the last year. Um, from the point of view of those people also, this full scale invasion was a disaster. So then we have to ask ourselves if as socialists, and Marxists, we sort of understand that the state is somehow the servant of capital, then why is there this complete disjunction between the economic uh, interests of the Russian elite and the commercial interests of its companies and uh, the military uh, aims of uh, the Kremlin. And I think the answer is that, yes, uh, states do um, guard the interests of capital, but they don't do it simply or directly. And that a very important function of the state is social control. I always uh, believed from uh, the start, uh, from uh, 2014, I remember going to, I mean, I, I could spend hours telling you all the things that I've said in 2014 or any other time which are wrong. But I remember this one, one talk I gave about the war at that time uh, at a gathering in London, and I called it War as a Means of Social Control. And uh, unfortunately, I think I, I've been proved right. I thought that the war in, um, in the Donbass, the background to that was the economic crisis of uh, 2008 to 2009, which suddenly brought this oil boom to an end. It was the social movements in Russia itself around the elections. It was the first time that you had this mass demonstrations and mass arrests of demonstrators uh, under Putin. That had not happened before. And um, the regime was really shaken. It was irritated and worried by the Orange Revolution of 2004 in Ukraine. Then came those social movements in Russia, a lot of unrest in uh, Belarus as well, and in Kazakhstan. I mean, the biggest uh, workers' action that there's been anywhere in the former Soviet space was the big oil workers' strike in Kazakhstan in 2011. So I think all these things were in the Kremlin's mind uh, when it came to 2013-14. They saw this huge movement in Ukraine. I, I mean, your listeners, and I know all of you in Ukraine know better than I do that this is a very contradictory movement. Uh, lots of ways in which uh, the, 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 it was not at all progressive, but anyway, a huge movement and a movement that the government not only could not control, the Yanukovych government, but a movement that overthrew that, overthrew that government. Now, that scared Putin. I think that's without any question at all. And 
it forced him along this path of this imperialist nationalism. I mean, I think, you know, I think I've, I've seen articles where Putin said a lot of this kind of mad stuff about, uh, you know, the Russian Empire and about Ukraine not really being a country and all this. kind. Of, I think that goes back a long way. But I think it's very clear that it was exacerbated after 2014. You have the role of the Russian nationalists in uh, Donbass. And I think then we, we, we're lurching on the path uh, towards 2022. But then in 2020, you had this uh, huge unrest in Belarus, I think very, very worrying uh, for the Kremlin. You had the events in Kazakhstan in uh, 2022. I think clearly Putin, if not everybody else in the Russian elite, had clearly decided already by that point uh, for, that there was going to be some sort of major military action in uh, Ukraine. But uh, if he was hesitating, perhaps the events in Kazakhstan helped him to stop hesitating. And uh, then we had uh, the full-scale invasion. And with that, we've seen an, a, a, an exacerbation of this uh, nationalist uh, ideology. I mean, there's a... There's a, a comparison in a way with, and it's only a very limited comparison because thankfully it hasn't led to the, the horrible uh, war that, uh, has, that Russia has um, prosecuted in Ukraine. But if, if we think about the change in the British Conservative Party over the last few years, um, th the uh, Brexit uh, the which again, I mean, British business people hate it. It's no good for business to break up in such a bad way with your your number one trading partner. It doesn't make any sense at all. And it was a point where the Conservative Party so badly needed the votes that it thought it could get by waving the British flag, by uh, this horrible campaign against migrants, the most vulnerable people that are crossing the channel from France in these small boats, um, you know, abusing them and uh, uh, terrorizing them in every possible way and uh, uh, creating conditions where the, the boats sink and people drown. Uh, this real kind of a racist attack on and, and xenophobic attack on on migrants and this is a change i mean the the conservative party was always kind of racist and on some level but it it it's its politics have changed and gone really to the sort of extreme right and i see a i see a comparison um it's a it, it, it it's a former imperial power which has lost its strength um and in the course of this Brexit, uh, it has actually created a huge crisis for itself in Ireland um, because of the. it's a whole complicated thing about the way that Northern Ireland fits into the UK. But the point is, it's a former imperialist power. It's the drive towards the, this, these forms of nationalism uh, which are designed to stoke up hatreds within the population to damage social movements, to weaken social movements. And I think those also things are true in the Russian case. And of course, in the Russian case, the outcomes have just been a million times worse. And, and we're, the, the, the result has been this full scale invasion, um, which what, what I see at the moment is that the, the Kremlin not only uh, it not only doesn't want to get out of it, but also doesn't know how to get out of it. Um, it's continuing with uh, the war because it doesn't know what else to do, uh, tactically and strategically. And uh, that, of course, is a terrible uh, thing for, for Ukraine. And, and uh, uh, you're, anyway, you're, of course, your listeners know much better than I do about that. Um, and, you know, we continue our... If, uh, very modest attempts to, to develop solidarity and solidarity with Ukrainian communities uh, and Ukrainian uh, labour movement uh, here in the UK. And uh, yeah, perhaps that's a, a place to end. Simon, thanks a lot for your time and expertise. You're doing amazing work as a researcher and activist. Thanks a lot for that. Bye.
goodbye. Thanks again uh, for your questions and uh, best wishes to all of you. You listen to podcast To Learn, Did and Read by Commons Journal. And today we spoke to Simon Pirani, researcher of energy from London. Unfortunately, this is the only episode available in English. Most of them are in Ukrainian. And now we do not have possibility to make this podcast in English, but we have a lot of articles translated to English on our website, commons.com.ua. If you want to help our journal to develop and at some point also have episodes of this podcast in English, please consider supporting us financially. At least we need money to pay for my English classes. So I do not speak like Slavo Žižek anymore. Uh, you can do so by clicking the button Support Commons in the top left corner of our website. Thanks for being with us today. Bye!